President Stewart, uh, Ms. Gidmore, ladies and gentlemen, fellow Rotarians, let's see if I can get this to work. One of the great, uh, I've got to get that off of you in a hurry. <laughs> One of the great benefits uh, in our profession is the, the great privilege of uh, practicing law with great partners like Mike Cronin. And it's really a privilege to be here with you, Mike. Where'd he go? He ran out. You heard it before. Um, I'm like a bad penny. I'm on a 10-year cycle with Rotary. In uh, 1992, uh, I made my maiden presentation here when I talked about the reconstruction of East Berlin shortly after the wall came down. Uh, then the title of that presentation was how I escaped Berlin with my ex-mother-in-law on the midnight train from Moscow. It was very exciting. <laughs> In 2002, I had a somber presentation on the mechanics uh, and the immediate uh, physical and emotional aftermath of the destruction of the World Trade Center. And hopefully this presentation today will be a little bit more upbeat. It's, I've entitled it Rebirth. Uh, by any measure, this is a monumental construction project and it is uh, not just another construction project and you can't begin to address this project without spending a little time addressing what came before. And I'm going to do that now for a couple of minutes. Rightly or wrongly, the greatness of a culture is judged in large measure by the greatness of its monumental structures. And that tendency has even been given a name. It's called monumentality. We see evidence of monumentality at least as early as the book of Genesis, where some now long forgotten scribe perhaps first linked the concepts of culture and structure when that scribe said, come, let us build ourselves a town and a tower with its top reaching heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves so that we may not be scattered about the whole earth. That picture on the slide is a Renaissance engineer's depiction of how one would go about building a tower in the 1500s that would reach heaven. David Rockefeller was the father of the World Trade Center, and in 1960, he predicted in words that could have been taken from Genesis that the World Trade Center will telegraph to the world the economic might and preeminence of New York. But Ada Louise Huxtable, then the architecture critic for the Wall Street Journal, was not so sure. She said the Trade Center Towers could be the start of a new skyscraper age or the biggest tombstones in the world. The World Trade Center site is shown in the upper left corner of this picture. This is a 1958 photo. It's located on 300 years of fill. This was the construction waste site for Manhattan. When the World Trade Center was built on that site, it was built in something called a concrete bathtub, and I'm going to come back and talk about that concrete bathtub uh, as, the, as the afternoon progresses. The point I'd like to make now is everything you see in the front part of that slide, Battery City Park and the World, Trans the World Finance Center, would have collapsed after 9-11, but for the incredible bravery of women and men who literally dove into the darkness and stabilized the bathtub. When the towers came down, all of what the engineers call lateral stability in the bathtub was compromised. And so the tragedy, as great as it was, could have been indescribably worse. The design for the original Twin Towers was very radical and innovative. All of the load was carried by 236 exterior columns. It, in theory, it was thought that there was no practical limit to how tall a tower could be built using this design theory. The only practical limit at that time was the height to which elevators could climb, which in that day was about 180 stories. Fire compartmental, uh, the, the World Trade Center was the first building, commercial building in the world, 
to be designed to withstand the impact of an airplane. And this slide depicts an airplane from World War II, the size of which crashed into the Empire State Building, and then progressive cross-sections of design uh, with the original towers. Fire protection, in addition to sprinkler systems, was maintained by horizontal compartmentalization using normal commercial floor slabs. And Jimmy Bornstein and Clyde Warner, who are in the room, will recognize this. This is not a picture of the World Trade Center. This is a typical commercial building, the way you would build a floor slab in a typical commercial building. And I'm going to return to this a little bit later. This is a typical floor cross-section foot plan uh, of one of the towers. You'll notice that in the core of the building, all of the fire exits are, are located. The elevators and the fire exits are all in the core. Now this core area was surrounded by a double thickness of drywall which exceeded the fire code and exceeded the building code requirements at the time uh, of the construction of the original World Trade Center. And we're going to return to that a little bit later as well. Uh, in July 2001, developer, developer Larry Silverstein, who was then 70 years old, signed a 99-year lease with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to manage and sub-lease the World Trade Center buildings. Mr. Silverstein had an early doctor's appointment on the morning of September 11th. He actually had planned and intended to cancel that doctor's appointment and go directly to work in the North Tower of the World Trade Center. His wife found out, and as wives are tend to do, she raised hell with him, told him he had to go to the doctors, and so he did. While Mr. Silverstein was at his doctor's office, American Flight 11 was being flown south over Midtown Manhattan. It crashed into the north face of the North Tower at 8.46 a.m. United, United Flight 175 was flown over Staten Island, turned north, and turned and crashed into the south face of the south building at 9.02 a.m. The 236 steel columns shuddered and swayed, and then they did exactly what they were designed to do. All of the bolts and weld and design theory held. And then there was the fire. Insulation was blown off much of the steel in the impact areas, and that double thickness of drywall was, of course, no protection at all. Between 1,000 and 3,000 gallons of fuel were immediately con consumed in what's called the fireball effect. The remaining jet fuel spread across the impact floors and down igniting, floor, uh, igniting fires along the way. When fully engaged, the fires covered five acres of floor area in each building. The instantaneous energy output from each of the fires approximated the energy output of as many as 10 nuclear power stations. Occupants within and above the impact areas were unable to evacuate because, as you will remember, all three stairways were in the central core area and that had been blocked and destroyed by the crash. And whenever I give this talk, I hesitate on whether I should show this particular slide. And I do because we, it reminds us of the humanity involved in this because if you look closely, you can see people uh, yelling out the windows above the impact area. At 9.56 a.m., 56 minutes after it was struck, the South Tower collapsed. The North Tower continued to stand until 10.29 a.m. The World Trade Center Towers contain... I, I'm, I'm not quite ready yet. The World Trade Center Towers stored more than three times 10 to the 12th joules of potential energy. That's enough energy to slingshot an automobile around the world 46 times. I'm going to now show you a series of 20 slides that I have now that were not available to me in 2002. 
these demonstrate that transfer of potential energy into kinetic energy. First you'll see the south tower collapse and then you'll see the north tower collapse. The north tower is still standing there and there and there now the, and there. Now the north tower is coming down. The term nuclear winter was used to describe the condition in Manhattan after the collapse. 2,982 victims from 90 separate countries died on September 11th. There was never any question that New York was going to rebuild. Some of you may remember the presentation I gave in 2002 I uh, remarked that I was a little bit scandalized because in the conference call that Mike alluded to on September 12th, already the engineers were talking about rebuilding on the site. Paul Goldberger, the architecture critic for the New York Times, again in words that are reminiscent of Genesis, said, it is important that New York rebuilds the tallest buildings in America. Something that we had was taken away. We have to show the world that we have the willpower to bring it back again. And they have. The project's heart is one World Trade Center formerly known as Freedom Tower, 1,776 feet tall. Its soul is the 9-11 memorial. The entire plan is oriented toward the memorial. Every year at the exact moment of the attack, an uninterrupted wedge of sunlight will strike the memorial. The central axis of the transit hall that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes is aligned to the 9-11 sunlight so that the sun will shine down onto the wedge. The walls of Tower 2, which you see in this slide, were changed so that no shadow would fall on the memorial at the hour of the attack on September 11th. The dramatic slope that you see at the top of Tower 2 is directed down toward the center of the site so that anywhere, anywhere you are in New York City, if you can see Tower 2, you have a reminder of what happened on September 11th. There are seven major projects planned or underway right now on the site. There are three transit facilities, each of which is world class. There's an underground vehicle security screening facility, which is the most sophisticated anywhere in the world. There's the September 11th Memorial, the September 11th Museum, a concert hall, and six high-rise structures, including Tower One, the tallest tower, the tallest building in America. The seven projects share what is easily the busiest and most congested and most complex construction site uh, in the world. They're all being built inside that bathtub I talked about they all have separate contractors. They all share the same access and the same utilities. They're being built under some of the tightest security in the world. 3,300 construction workers report to work there every day, and when they report, they go through an iris scan, just like you see on NCIS, to try to keep terrorists off of the site. Directly under Greenwich Street, which runs in this slide vertically down through the center of the site, is Pathline 1. Now, Pathline 1 is the main subway link to Lower Manhattan. It absolutely has to stay in operation in order for the transit system in Lower Manhattan and then on to New Jersey to work. So when it was destroyed on 9-11, in this slide, the tube you see on the wall there in the bathtub wall is where path line one came through. That has been rebuilt in a 1,000 foot tunnel, temporary tunnel, suspended 50 feet above the floor of the bathtub. And everything you're going to see from this point forward had to be built around path line one that continued to run uninterrupted 24-7 while all of the work around it continued. 